We hope you enjoy the videos as a little teaser for um, tonight uh, networking and informal panel discussion event. Again, welcome everybody and welcome those who are joining us uh, live stream. We are so glad you could join us tonight. My name again is Christina Alecki, director, uh, executive director of the Chicago Council on Science and Technology, or as we refer to it, C2ST. Those of you who are not familiar with the organization, we are a nonprofit organization. We aim to highlight and showcase the rele relevance of science and technology in today today's society. Today, our aim is to do what C2ST does the best, act as a consortium and bring uh, different STEM professionals together or aspiring STEM professionals together and bring them, bring them together to network and meet and uh, meet across different institutions. Um, uh, we hope you enjoy the panel discussion. At seven o'clock, we will have networking event in the back of the room. Um, while you were settling in your seats, we asked you to submit questions to our moderator, Emily, and she will have some of your, some of your questions that she will ask from the panelists. And with this, I would like to introduce you, uh, introduce Emily to you. Of course, you have seen her video, but a little bit more formal um, introduction. Um, Emily is a science communicator and YouTube educator. Her YouTube channel, The Brain Scoop, has been live since January 2013. Um, she has over a quarter million subscribers, and she is currently the first ever Chief Curiosity Correspondent for the Field Museum. And with that, Emily, please introduce the panelist. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our little video. I just got back from the Peruvian Amazon where I was for three weeks and we got back on Halloween. So it hasn't been that long and I hope I have finally washed all of the jungle smells out of my hair, <laughs> along with the stink bugs. So I am going to be the moderator tonight of this panel discussion. It's going to be an informal, you know, casual conversation. Um, I want to introduce our amazing panelists today. Seriously, when, I, when they sent me the list of who would be on this panel, my jaw dropped a little bit. I don't think I've talked to like as many women scientists with as long like CVs and lists of accolades as the people who we're talking with tonight, so uh, I'm fangirling a little bit. Um, we have Crystal Thomas, who is the Deputy Governor of Illinois. Here you can Crystal Thomas, thank you. Yeah, you can come on. Just sit down. Um, uh, Ann Schlenker, the Director of the Center for Transportation Research at Argonne National Laboratory. Susan Hollin, the Intellectual Property Management Solutions Manager and Business Development Executive at IBM. We have Anoma Lobby, the Program Director for Girls for Science. Yeah. And Carolyn Phillips, oh sorry. Uh, Carolyn Phillips, the Raman Fellow in the Mathematics and Computer Science Division at the Argonne National Laboratory. So. I've introduced you all, and I, I was wondering if we could just kind of go down the line and start off this discussion by um, talking about something, some accomplishment that you've had at your job, and giving us a little bit of a background and detail of what it what it is that you do. And I know it, all of your jobs are very complicated, and it's difficult to summarize in you know 140 characters or less, as I'm used to communicating with on Twitter format. Um, but yeah, Carolyn, you want to start? Okay. Let's see. It's just oh, good. Um, so I'm a postdoc. Uh, in, at Argonne in the Math and Computer Science Division. Uh, my research means that I work with math, that's not me, uh, math, computer science, physics, material science. I like problems that somehow manage to hit on all of them. Uh, when that happens, I'm really excited. So uh, you're like STEM embodied in I am one STEM person. embodied in one person, <laughs> yeah. Um, and th what your question was, what makes, what do we enjoy, what's something we're proud yeah, of? Yeah, some just project that you've, that you've recently accomplished during the past that you're wow. especially proud of. I am always the most proud of whatever the most recent research is that I actually got published. 
of, <laughs> of that's about then and then I'm on to the next thing. Uh, so we have a, a paper coming out next week that's about how these particles can pack in these really complex ways and how we can make them do it and how they have cool math properties and that's something that I'm really proud of. Cool, good. Got a gnome? Oh yeah. I'm the director for Girls for Science and as well a high school biology and forensic science teacher. I'm very proud of Girls for Science from when we started back five years and I've seen the progress, the number of girls that have gone through the program and the number of girls that have gone on to pursue STEM careers in the university. Well, I'm also proud to be a teacher, to take all this research back into the classroom and, um, and just get um, especially our females to take more interest in, in science. And um, you know, for most part of it, we have, maybe some of the girls have gone into colleges to pursue you know, science maybe careers, STEM careers, and engineering, computer science. But I'm still hoping and working um, to see more females, more girls actually go into that field. So Girls for Science has been an avenue to get all the girls together in one place and introduce them, expose them to STEM activities that you know, gets to interest them and motivate them to move on to um, STEM-based careers. And these are high school students? High school students, yes. Great. Wonderful. Sue? Great. So I'm Sue Helen. I work for IBM um, in their intellectual property area within the research division which translates to we bring money back to the bottom line to be able to fund our research in major ways, which is a really good thing and helps out a lot of companies. Um, the thing I guess I'm most proud of or, or most excited about is the fact that I've been able to take an engineering degree and go in a lot of different directions. So I didn't stop with one thing. I was able to take it into many, many different directions from automated mapping and facility mapping to product development to product life cycle to business consulting and now into intellectual property. So to me, just the fact that STEM and engineering opens doors and opens your brain, um, I think it's the most exciting thing. That's certainly, oh, we are on, good. So my name is Ann Schleicher, and from Argonne as well. Um, engineering degree uh, by training, and I head the Center for Transportation Research. We do a lot of work with the Department of Energy, and so that really translates into reducing petroleum consumption and our cars and trucks, and even the big rigs going down the highways, and diversifying what those energy sources might be for alternative fuels, alternative powertrains. One of the things I'm, I'm most proud of is really trying to up that fuel economy for our vehicles because nobody likes to pay even when it's only $2.60 a gallon. We, we would still rather get more uh, miles out of every one of our dollars that we spend. So within that uh, venue, I actually helped the Department of Energy establish what the research agenda might want to look like within transportation and what some of the cost and performance targets ought to be. Hi, I'm Crystal Thomas. I'm Deputy Governor of the State of Illinois. And let's see, what does that mean? Um, I really sit at the intersection of policy and politics, and my job is to take Governor Quinn's vision and his priorities for the state of Illinois and figure out how to best implement those and to make sure that they move forward. So there's really a lot of work that is done and a lot of problem solving and a lot of being creative and, and kind of figuring out how to make things work um, the way that, that, uh, that we hope that they work. One of the things that I'm most, I think, proud of uh, is the work that we did on health reform. And over the past year, we've gotten over 730,000 people in Illinois enrolled in health insurance. Uh, and I think one of the other things that I feel that personally I've been able to accomplish is uh, 
I was struck by the video if you guys um, you know, saw Deborah Shore at the Water Reclamation District talking about being at that intersection of science and policy and politics um, that because of my science background and the passion that I have, I think I've been able to bring a little bit more of the, you know, kind of those research principles into the work that I've done and the work that we do. Um, and there's really a lot of opportunity for that, particularly in, in healthcare, um, looking at, you know, incorporating health through research into health policy. Um, and that's something that I've, you know, really brought to my work. And I think that, you know, it's helped make our programs better. That's wonderful. Congratulations, this is all amazing accomplishments. Um, I wanna casually ask kind of people in the audience just so I get an idea. How many, raise your hand if you are currently enrolled in some kind of scientific program or you have a science degree? It's like most of the people here. What, what about the humanities or liberal arts? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So I, um, I graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Art. I actually have no scientific background and I did not pass college algebra. I never thought that science or math was a thing that I could do. And so I kind of want to ask you guys, like, was science always something that you saw for yourself um, as a young student, as a high school student in college, or was there any, any doubt in your mind that it might not be the field for you? And anybody, feel free to jump in. Um. It, well, I mean, I'll say for me, it was something that I was always interested in um, from the time that I was young and, you know, entered and won science fairs in middle school and high school and then decided to pursue a degree in molecular genetics in college. Um, so honestly, it really wasn't until I got to the end of my undergraduate career that I started to have those doubts you know, about do I really see myself being able to make a career out of this, being able to make a living out of this, and, um, you know, ultimately uh, made the decision to go in a, a different direction and uh, get a, a, degree in, um, a degree in public policy and still kind of incorporate my passion for science from a science policy point of view, but that was really how um, my path ended up, you know, kind of moving forward. So. I was actually, I've always loved math and science. I've always loved taking things apart, putting them back together, breaking things. You know, I was, I was the kid following my father around as an electrician, learning how to do all of that stuff, because I loved all of it. Um, but when I started going to college, and, and I went to Purdue, I was originally in pre-law. Much, much different from anything that I'd been doing, because I also loved writing, and I loved uh, more of the, the softer skills. Um, but I got a, a note from the Society of Women Engineers, and this is in the 70s. So at that time, there weren't a lot of engineers, of female engineers out there. But I got a note from them that said, you really should look at this. Your scores are good enough in math. You're good enough in science. Come take a look at engineering. And I've never looked back, and I would never look back. I think to be open to thinking in both ways and using both sides of your brain is an incredible thing that I think you'll hear from everybody here. We've got a lot of engineering and a lot of science and a lot of math, but if we can't articulate that, that's an issue. So you've got to be able to do both. And it was just a, a notice, just like a note that you got that was like, yeah. hey, come do this. And you're like, well, that sounds like a good yeah, idea. Yeah. I guess I'll do that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think something else you something else you hit on really well is that like communication and the arts and the creative side of it, which is oftentimes so separated. Like I'm a huge advocate for STEAM because let's throw the art back in there and not eliminate all these creative thinkers because so many of you went to school for something else and then you've learned to kind of incorporate your background into what you're doing now. Um, uh, I don't know where I was going with that question. Um, yeah, is the are there? Let me think about this. It's my first time being a moderator on a panel. I sit on the panel usually. Um, let's see. So, Carolyn, can you talk a little bit about, you know, you have this, this diverse background. You seem to encapsulate everything in, in STEM. Was there ever, um, ever anything that you wanted to focus on more than another? Does that make sense? Um, I, so, my background is that I started in math and then I went into mechanical engineering and nuclear engineering, and then I went back to physics and computing. And that's why I'm so qualified to do what I do today. <laughs> um, and I think 
if I, my under, when I look back, I really look at it as a journey of self-discovery. Uh, I started in theoretical math, and I was like, ah, oh, just I like it, but I don't know if I like it so much. I can do this forever. And then I said, oh, I'm going to do some experimental work, and I discovered experimental work is not for everybody. Um, I nearly blew, like, blew up my project about twice. So I was like, well. You're not talking about like just messing it up. You're talking about like a serious explosion here. So I, and I discovered like through this process that I really loved computational work. And I liked it because no matter what I do, <laughs> the most that can happen is my computer will crash and there will be no damage. You restart it, it goes again. Uh, and I liked how it brought in math and engineering. So I think it was kind of, uh, I think sometimes when, if you're young in the sciences, there's this idea that you have to know at 17 what you're gonna do, and you have to go to the right school, and then you have to go to the right grad school, and you gotta, you gotta get everything right. And at least my experience was, you know, you can really kind of take some time to self-discover and reinvent and move to what you really love. Yeah, and be a little flexible and, and take opportunities as they come. And they change over time, right? So as you right. said, what you thought you were interested in and what you loved at 17 wasn't necessarily what you wanted to do at 30. So it changes over the lifetime of your career and to be able to navigate that and take it into different directions is the magic of STEM. That's me. Yeah, when I was 17, I wanted to like still be reading Harry Potter and, you know, living in a magical world. So who knows what a 17 year old really knows what they want. Um, <laughs> um, Anom, what is your experience in, I, one thing that I hear a lot is like, how can we get more girls interested in science? And my experience is that girls are inherently interested in science. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yes, I think the main issue with girls uh, developing interest in science is um, just having people that will mentor them and um, especially in the middle school, when, when they are between fifth to sixth grade, uh, we tend to lose most of these girls because uh, they don't have mentors, they don't have, um, most of the schools, well, I don't want to name schools, the school system, um, the teachers at that level are not trained to teach them. So the focus is just on reading and math reading math, and then you're teaching math in isolation without the science, it creates a lot of problem. So by the time they get to high school, and they now be threw them into physics class, you know, biology, chemistry, everything seems to be really disconnected, they, they just lose the interest, because the focus on the middle school is just reading and writing. So I think the problem, the, the a way to really um, elevate this problem would be to get people, professionals that are you know, STEM, they are in the industry to those great levels where the girls can see people like them, you know, that have these high power careers and, you know, that will help them to be you know, better interested in STEM careers. Crystal, did you have something to say on that? Yeah, I think a part of getting girls to be interested in science is to just help to open just help to open their eyes about science. Because science is all around us every day, but we don't really grow up recognizing that. You have um, somebody who's like, your makeup is made out of chemicals. Right, exactly, and, your, and food, and you know, um, and the video about you know, water, and so all of these things that are around you, and once you know, your eyes are actually opened up to, you know, that this is science and that is science, and, and there's a magic to that. I mean, there really is, and when you start doing experiments, and it, it, it just gets exciting, um, but it really takes, you know, that somebody who can help open your eyes to look at ordinary things in an extraordinary way, um, and that can, can really just, you know, open the world and just start, you know, just kind of start that lifelong love. If I can just share a personal experience coming after Thanksgiving. Um, it happened to be with family, and there's a little seven, uh, seven-year-old, eight-year-old who made the little girl, uh, made the first comment that, oh, math is so hard, I don't like math. This girl is brilliant. And uh, so whatever pressure she was feeling, however she was internalizing that, and it's a, a function of just spending a little time and encouraging 
and uh, not putting her at the wayside because if it wasn't curbed right away, then I, I think that she wouldn't have had that positive momentum to um, really understand what her capabilities are. So some of that is really a, a confidence in, in giving giving back as well as giving time. Yeah. So you, you all think that it starts at an at a age that is that young and that influential. Because um, then we're talking about like, well, once people get into middle school and high school, do you think if they haven't been encouraged since an incredibly young age, they already have like kind of lost interest by that time? I, I think there's a lot of, um, if you look at what kids are being told and even non-intentional um, support or non-support for math and science. So there's almost a predisposition that says, well, you don't need to worry about that. Well, yes, you do. Mm -hmm. You absolutely do. They told one of my nieces in seventh or eighth grade, you don't need math. Don't even worry about that. And I went in and talked to the counselor and almost took his neck off. Oh, God. Was, it, it was just such a foreign idea to me. Um, when I was in fifth grade, when they were deciding who's going to go into advanced placement classes right in high school, um, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, and they were deciding this, and one of my math teachers said, I don't think you're ready for that. I think we're going to hold you back. And all it did was make me angry, right? So you have the choice to decide. Are you going to be, are you going to step back and say, I, yeah, maybe it is too hard for me. I can't do that. Or are you going to get mad and say, I want to be with my friends. I'm going that route, right? So I got mad and went into engineering. I, you, know, <laughs> you really showed them. <laughs> yeah, who's laughing now? It was Mr. Andrews. Yeah. <laughs> See you, Mr. Andrews. Yeah, and what about you? You, um, you worked at Chrysler for 30 or more years, and, and during that time, um, you oversaw huge... Uh, departments of people or a large department of people and I would say the majority of them were probably men um, in your uh, career and experience how have you seen women's uh, involvement in your field in particular do you think do you think things are are easier do you think they're more challenging do you... so I, I think they're easier um, certainly had that witness um, in a very dominated male profession um, within engineering and within the automobile culture uh, back in the Detroit area. Um, but had a series of mentors all the way through my career. And uh, those in particular, uh, I now count not only as colleagues, but really friends, uh, because that helped pave the way as well. Um, when you're feeling isolated, alone, um, just almost self-doubt uh, creeping in every now and then over what your capabilities were. Uh, there was somebody to uh, bounce ideas off. Um, now, of course, um, more often, there's uh, multiple women in the meetings as well as uh, you being the only Lone Ranger there. And uh, what I also comment on is that it's recognized that uh, women have their own opinion, their own values, their own contributions that they can make. And of course, uh, in transportation, we sell cars to women and men, you know. <laughs> so it'd be, it'd be very good if, uh, you know, there was that influence and that perspective coming in as well. And so at the time, it was a little dissension in the opinion, you know, when uh, you would speak up. But uh, over the multiple of years, it was actually respected and it was welcomed. So I, I encourage that aspect also. What about any of you who have done work overseas? How do you see, we talk a lot, and this is all like a very focused on the United States, and I know we're all speaking from a point of privilege here and that women have more opportunities in the sciences than probably in a lot of other countries. Um, can any of you share any of your experiences? So, so just a, a quick one. I was uh, headed to South Korea the last week of October, and I was meeting with a research organization and then also was going to meet with a um, auto industry uh, representative, you know, you can probably connect the dots, right? And uh, culture-wise, they needed to um, match up someone of the same sort of um, level or esteem level as what I was coming in, and uh, they were unable to do that. 
and so actually I was not welcome <laughs> at the what? at that particular company. I w did all my other research uh, stops within that, but uh, that particular client I could not visit because they didn't have the same level of person available to host me. Wow. That's shocking. <laughs> It's not so shocking. It, it's, uh, I am very naive. Um. Um, I, I did a lot of work back in, in Japan probably about a decade ago. And the very first time that I went to Japan in the early 90s, um, I had a team of people, and I was the lead for the team doing some development work. And when we walk into a room, they would immediately talk to whoever the guy next to me was, right? and wouldn't look me in the eye, wouldn't talk to me, wouldn't do anything. So by the end of it, because I was one, a little frustrated, and two, knew nothing was gonna work, I would stand behind him and whisper the answers in his ear. <laughs> and, he would, and then he would be able to articulate it, and eventually they got the idea that it wasn't him talking, it was me, and, and we got through it. But it, there's still quite a bit of bias out in um, a lot of countries out in the world, and it's just a question of being um, confident enough, but also not giving up your ground and standing up and, and really working for it. So what can we do uh, if we are doing work overseas or like um, if we have these great women leaders in STEM like what, or just uh, male leaders as well, what can we do to help um, maybe make these work envir environments a little more equitable uh, overseas? I know IBM as a whole, we, we do quite a bit in both um, bringing women into these meetings, giving them the power, and, you know, and they're earning the power, but actually not judging anybody based solely on are you a man, are you a woman, but it's based on what have you done and what is your, your expertise that you're bringing to the table and giving them those positions. So now we've got executives, female executives in Japan, female executives in um, Korea and China, and that helps set the bar. But they have to do the same thing that we're doing here. What about science education for girls worldwide? Be sure. Yes, um, just coming from a different um, environment, because I'm from Nigeria, and um, I think I do have a lot to say about that because um, females, I mean, if you, really in the news, I mean, I don't know, a couple of girls were kidnapped, and I don't know if how many people know that the girls are still, they have not been found, and the only reason is because they are girls. I mean, so that is not a good enough reason, but that's just the way it is in some parts of the world. And um, so I think one of the, the way to really address this issue would be to locally I have programs like we have for Girls for Science, and that's one thing I've been trying to do. That's my ultimate goal, to be able to go back home and just be a face to talk to people about, you know, your girl, your daughter is not just good alone to have babies or have children. They have a brain, they have a future. They can contribute to the society. They can contribute globally to the world and just encourage girls to go to school and encourage them because we have, very girls that are very eager to go to school, but because of economic issues, the parents marry them out just for economic reasons, and nobody cares because they are girls. So it's, this is really a global situation, and I can understand why you won't find females in countries like that just because of this reason. They are not economically viable to send them to school for the parents. So this needs to be a global thing, and that's just my, my goal. My next step is to take this back home. Sure. It is getting better. Yeah. Crystal, did you have something? No, I was just going to say, I think another thing that we can do, that we need to do, is just to lead by example. And I think that there are things that we can do in this country as well to be, you know, to have better and more inclusive, more supportive work environments, uh, you know, for, for women in and outside of STEM. Uh, and that, you know, that speaks volumes internationally and you know it, and it, it helps so if we do a better job of leading by example then you know we'll be able to have more influence in being able to bring that as we are interacting with companies and with leaders in different countries as well yeah uh, actually a few years ago i went to a conference in abu dhabi which was about um how to 
increased the presence of women in the Middle East in science. And one of the things I learned there is that this is, this is a very heterogeneous problem. A woman in Egypt is not a woman in Saudi Arabia, and both of them were there at that same conference. Um, but, and they had different, very different struggles, so this was a really kind of an interesting event to see. So there's, I think these kind of like collaborative events between the US and other countries are, are very uh, helpful. I also think that, you know, this is kind of a slow diffusion mechanism, but we do educate the world in the United States. Uh, there are, Argonne is full of uh, international scientists who come to the U.S. Our universities are full of international you know, men and women who come to the U.S. And I feel that you know, when we make our own universities more egalitarian and encouraging places, we are kind of diffusively exporting some of our, our values with respect to women in science. Crystal, I had a question for you about, um, I know you have experience in healthcare, especially in Illinois. Um, and this is, I, I don't know if it's generally just focused in Illinois, but in the United States in general, one of the things I talk about a lot when people are like, how do we get more retention in women in higher level positions in academia and in tenure tracks? And one of the things I say is like, well, unless the United States starts offering paid maternity leave, you're just going to be missing out. Like, what, what, is your, what are your thoughts on that? What is, do we have the fing our finger on the right pulse in saying like we need to enact like better health care for women and better better family and, and government support? I think you absolutely have your finger on the pulse and that was what I was alluding to when I said that in this country we could really and, and need to do a better job of having, you know, workplace policies, you know, that are more supportive and, and inclusive of women. Um, I mean, I don't want to single anyone out, but just, you know, this week there was the story about UPS not um, having policies for uh, for, for pregnant workers, and you know that, and those are you know so those are examples. You know, having um, last year the governor uh, you know fought for and signed a um, anti-discrimination uh, pregnancy discrimination bill. Uh, you know, that was something that we re recognized that we actually needed in Illinois because some of those things are happening. Uh, having, um, you know, a nationwide, you know, kind of standardized maternity leave policy and family leave policies, uh, you know, for women. And this is something that a lot of European countries have, for instance, and um, has been very helpful in, um, you know, supporting women in, in entering and staying in and being able to advance in the workforce. So uh, that that's uh, a conversation. There are some things that uh, this, that policies at the state level can do, policymakers at the state level can do, but um, it's really a national issue. And I think it's really something that we just, you know, as women need to continue to have a voice around um, and to, you know, and to advocate for uh, so that people know that, that it is important and it is something um, that could make a huge difference uh, for working women in this country. Do you think we're close? Like, is it, is that a ridiculous question? <laughs> no, I, I don't think it's a ridiculous question, but um, unfortunately, no, I don't think that we're close. I don't think that it's nearly as um, high on the list of priorities or as much of a, um, you know, of a discussion um, at the national level and in Congress as it should be. Uh, I think that, you know, one of, another thing that we've been talking about in Illinois is passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, you know, that women uh, don't have equal protections under our Constitution, which a lot of, of us don't realize, and even some of us who do don't necessarily see, you know, or understand why that's important. But, you know, that conversation and then understanding what some of these, you know, policies are that impact women who, you know, who want to work or, um, you know, want to be able to have better balance between, you know, work and raising children, uh, all of that is important. And, um, and no, I, I don't think that we're going to get closer to that until, you know, we kind of raise our voices uh, more consistently um, in, uh, around those issues. I agree. And you know, it's something that, so I'm a part of the Field Museum Women in Science group and I'm on their publicity steering committee and you know, I spend a lot of time traveling and talking about women in science issues pretty much because I made one video out of, out of the hundred videos that we have on the Brain Scoop on our channel, one video is about social injustice. And one video highlights like the struggles that women in science deal with. It is my most popular video and it is what I am asked to talk about the most. And I feel like I am 
the least of an expert on women in science. I can tell you all about like family of bupressed jewel beetles. I can tell you all about natural history, but I never took a science course in college that was outside of my curriculum, and I never took a women's studies course. And so my, my impression when I'm a part of this women in science group is like, man, I don't think we're gonna get anywhere until we're at a point where we don't need a women in science group, where we're, we don't need to have events like this where you look out in the audience and it's primarily women interested in this subject. So what can we do to reclaim the word of feminism and not use that as like a, a dirty word that turns off the male sex? Because whether or not we want to admit it, it's, it is a hashtag he for she kind of problem. You know, we need to have voices on both sides to advocate for us. And culturally, in your workplace, in your jobs, do you see this, do you feel like you have male colleague support? Like to the point where we will be making good policy change? So let me just comment on um, where we just were. We were talking about maternity leave and bills coming forward and equal rights. Well, right along with that, bring in paternity care, right? So how about standardizing what we need to allow the men to be an equal partner in that uh, birth or adoption or whatever it might be as the uh, family members are, are growing. So I, I encourage that as well. And of course, you, you bring the men along that way at the same time um, together on that and, and realize that these are values that we all share coming through. I think that there are a lot of men who agree with these issues and who are supportive of them if they think about them. I think it's usually, you know, women, I, I, I like, I, I don't know if anyone has read Lean In, but I liked the beginning of that book with uh, uh, Sheryl Sandberg, who, you know, kind of says, I never even thought about having, uh, you know, a pregnancy policy or pregnancy parking spaces until I went through it myself. And so there are some, you know, there are some of those things that... Uh, you might care about an issue, but it's natural. You're not really going to think about it until or unless it's personal to you. And that's why supporting women in leadership, having women in leadership and supporting women in leadership is so important. And then once you are, and I'm speaking from personal experience, a woman in leadership and have a place where you can be influential, not being afraid to speak up. And in my experience, once that's happened, yes, my, um, you know, the, the men that I've worked for, that I've worked with, have typically been supportive of that, but it's not something that they would have thought about or were going to think about just naturally on their own. Right. So education is a major part of this as well, yeah. So with the tenure that I have within the field, um, one of the big changes that I noticed um, to support your point is really as the men that were my bosses at the time, they uh, had daughters. And all of a sudden, as their 25, 21-year-old girl was graduating, and they wanted the best possible position for her, they wanted her to have equal salary coming across, so here was their personal affiliation with it, and all of a sudden, they became the pro-feminist, if you will, okay. uh, on that part as well. So, it, you know, it, it comes slowly, but we certainly made great strides. I remember dropping out a hunter safety course when I was in seventh grade because my dad wanted me to do all this stuff and then I was one of two women and he didn't understand why I dropped out. And I was like, Dad, we need more women in hunter safety course. And that's my contribution to that anecdote. Um, but yeah, I, I get that. You, when you, you, know, you want to have the best for your child and you want them to have the same opportunities and then when they join one of these fields where they, they, don't, they don't see themselves or see people who are like them around them, retention is a little more difficult. Um, did I interrupt you? Okay. Um, all right. Why don't we Why don't we move the conversation to somewhat of a lighter note? I have I'm just reading through these cards, and some of them are kind of amusing. I hate to like change it so abruptly. Um, so this one's for Carolyn. My experience with math is solving trigonometry problems and doing algebra. What does it mean to do research? Do you just do algebra all day? <laughs> Um, so I think the experience that we have in math coming up through high school and probably, I don't know, maybe through college even, hard to say, is, is not, it's, it's, we, learn, we learn the mechanics uh, and I think the equivalent would be if you were, if you, were, if you took art class 
all the way through you know high school and your teachers only were like let's practice really straight lines all the time and then we'll we'll do a little shading and so forth and, th and then you thought okay well that's art uh, I feel like the way in which we largely teach math uh, at a young level is not actually what math is like. Math is actually, math and science, these are very creative fields where you come up with ideas. They're not, another thing I think about math is that when people think about doing math, they immediately think about doing homework or an exam where there's this pressure. Here's a problem, okay. Two trains are departing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You've got 20 minutes and then the quiz has to be turned in, solve this problem. And that's not what research is like at all. Research is creative. Research is like, you know, you come up with a solution, oh, that's really, no, that's not really good at all. And I'm going to go back to the drawing board and I'm going to talk to this person. I'm going to read. It's like read. writing a paper. Yes. It's like getting your outline and you're in the editing, deleting, and piecing things together. And, and I think I like something that's I try to do whenever I get a chance to do an outreach op, uh, event with girls in high school or below is trying to like come up with uh, hands-on math activities that, that are more like what actually doing research is like and less like let's solve problems. So, yeah. yeah. I think one of the, the things that's good about going through some of that let's solve problems though is that goes into your toolbox, right? It isn't the end all and the be all. How you use it is the really fun stuff. But you've got to understand it first to do that. So there is a certain amount of that drudgery that you've got to go through to understand what it is. But then you get to play and you get to apply and you get to really take it in a different direction. But I think you're right. I think you need to introduce both sides of the equation at the beginning. In my defense, I went through art school and we did paint vases <laughs> for years. I was a senior in college and it was still plastic vegetables and wine bottles because you had to get the ellipse just right and the chiaroscuro. That's an Italian term that Leonardo da Vinci and now you had to learn all this stuff and it wasn't until I went to a natural history museum and was like, what do you mean I can check out a badger skull and draw this instead? This is so much cooler than a plastic squash. And that's how I got my entry into science. Um, um, I have another question that was, I, I lost it now, but the question was just for the panels. Generally, what do scientists do for fun? I love this question. <laughs> what do you guys do for fun? Are you normal people with normal? <laughs> no? no? I think we're normal. Come on, please. <laughs> Um, Define that. Yeah, though. cooking. <laughs> cooking is fun, you know, with family and friends and trying new recipes. So it doesn't always have to be the chemistry experiment. Yeah. Um, reading and traveling is great fun, you know. Um, yeah, normal activities. <laughs> Not always the geek. <laughs> yeah, I think I think uh, normal is a, a different term. I, what I do for fun is uh, looked at as very unusual for most people, but I'm very into sports. So I do quite a few things in the master's level, which I call old people throwing stuff. Um, but we, you know, so track and field, I'll throw the hammer and the dust shot and the discus. Ow. I'll compete in Highland Games. I'll compete in powerlifting. So I do weird things. So I wouldn't call those normal, but they are certainly not geeky and they're a lot of fun. That's awesome. Um, I have done martial arts for years. It's a lot of fun. So, uh, like, two out of the five people on this panel could totally kick my butt right now. <laughs> At least. <laughs> I think, like, a lot of scientists I know and math and science people or technology people, I think what they, what they tend to bring to everything they do is, like, extra passion. So if they get into something, like, it can be the same thing as other people, but they tend to just do it, like, a little more, a little more extreme. <laughs> and you also start to apply physics to everything you do. <laughs> And competition. Yeah. Now I'm like extreme slow cookers, <laughs> extreme crochet. I've seen it. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah. Yeah. 
What I love about that question is just like, because it kind of speaks to the fact that like, I don't think the public or, or people in general see scientists as like approachable, you know, normal people. I love baking. I have a baking channel somewhere on the internet that's kind of hidden. But I, yeah, I mean, I love to bake. I play the violin. I repot my plants on the weekend. I'm, you know, I go to Target. It's a fun recreational activity. Um, you people watch. Yeah, I people watch, yeah. There's crazy people at that Roosevelt Target on the weekend. <laughs> um, do you think? Do you think that that has? Do you think that's a result of like what people see of scientists in the media in general? I mean, you turn on the TV, and anytime you see a scientist in the media, they have like the starchy lab coat. They usually have like bad social skills. Do you think that contributes to any lack of retention in the field at all? Well, I guess I can only speak personally, but um, I, I think that it does. I, I think that there is very much a stereotype, um, you know, in, in the you know lack of social skills and the scary smart, you know, uh, kind of tends to lends to you know unapproachable, um, you know, because what am I going to say to this person and am I going to seem stupid in comparison and you know and all of that, uh, and yeah, and I also think that. It makes it, it it makes it more difficult for us as as women to see ourselves then in that you know as being scientists and maybe even you know there's a reluctance to define ourselves self define self identify as scientists because you know it kind of creates that well I don't fit that image or I don't even want to fit that image you know kind of of thing and and the reality is what we have in, in common is that curiosity and you know that that rigor and that you know kind of, of passion for problem solving but otherwise we're very i mean we're we're diverse you know we have different we have different interests you know in our personal lives and you know in different personalities and you know we're, we're we are just normal people yeah. <laughs> yeah. except for except susan for sue <laughs> heavy lifting chain yeah, abnormal normal <laughs> Um, I think it's so funny when I when you like do a Google image search of scientist like 90% of the things are clip art as if you can't even have like a real scientist and then you have like one picture of Einstein down in the corner <laughs> and I, I talk about this when I go and talk about like the lack of uh, women in the media and sciences like if you go to the Wikipedia page they have a block and it just says scientists and there is only one woman on it for a long time, it was Marie Curie, the only female scientist in all of human history. And then they updated it a couple of years later and they threw Jane Goodall in there for good measure. And then Rosalind Franklin, but still in a block of like, I wanna say 36 male scientists, there are only three women scientists like listed. Clearly there are far more women scientists in history than, than just three. Do you think by incorporating women into history books that would also contribute to more diversity? I have a brief anecdote, which includes a confession. Please. <laughs> but you're not normal either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hardly. Uh, there's, there is a poster at work, and it says, the men of mathematics. <laughs> and it has kind of a history and so forth. And I was like, OK, let's, let's look over this thing. And I found two women in the poster of the men of mathematics. Wow. And I took a little tiny sticky note and I changed it to the people <laughs> and <laughs> put it up there. And then I measured how many weeks before, like I think probably someone on the cleaning staff was like, oh, what's this? And took it down. And I really should keep my campaign going though. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, I think we do have, you know, I think, you know, women have been, you know, like it have been, sociologically, from, for social reasons, barred from math and science for so long um, that I think it, it does feel like a history of men. Um, and I, I not quite, we need to work on that. And I think we also need to point to really amazing women who are out there right now doing amazing things. Yeah. And everybody up here. So actually, actually I met a really um, uh, dynamic woman, and she, uh, she and, and some uh, partners had put together a website called The Science Runway, just for that reason, um, to just give examples of amazing women who are in science today, so that girls who are, who are interested in science can go to this you know, resource and actually see people like them and get a sense of, you know, one, who are women in science? And two, what are some of the career paths? You know, because that was one of my, you know, just personally, that was one of my challenges when I was coming up in science was, um, 
you know, there were a, couple, a few boxes that I was aware of, you know, kind of a few possible paths that my career counselor could tell me about, and I've never done well in boxes, and so if I didn't fit into this box or this box, which I didn't, then, you know, I was like, well, maybe this isn't for me, because I, I don't, you know, see, you know, and now, I mean, obviously, I know that there are so many things, you know, as, as Susan said, you can, you know, kind of take this background and this degree, and you can move it in so many different directions, and I mean, it's really incredible. Uh, but a lot of times when you're, you know, a senior in high school or a senior in college, you just don't know that. You don't know all of the, you know, avenues that could open up. And that's something that I think we, events like this, help with and that we can do a much better job of, of just, you know, kind of opening up that world for people. Yeah, I think there's also, we need to do a better job of educating counselors and educating them on the the opportunities and the open doors and all of it because that's part of it was all of us through school went to a counselor at some point to say you know what could we measure in what are the possibilities where do we want to go and didn't often get an answer that said stem in any way shape or form what about you Noam, in your experience in, in chicago public school in addition to that i think it would be really powerful to see women like you in those classrooms mm -hmm and programs that you know target girls towards STEM careers, women like you will really be a face for the females to really connect to and say, wow, she did all this wonderful, she's doing these wonderful things. They will be interested in doing it. So we need more you know, presence, women presence in schools and classrooms because I mean, teachers, we are just so isolated in those classrooms. You don't know what is going on out there or you, you're just teaching to a test so that's all we need to have people come into the classroom female scientists talk to the teachers to encourage the female teachers as well to you know opportunities just that partnership collaborate with teachers in the classrooms mm -hmm. female scientists this, that would be really great for public for the girls to just see somebody like them so i think the other thing that there's five um, new stem academies two or three years old in the chicago area each one is um, affiliated with a company. So IBM has a Sarah Good Academy on the south side uh, where we have teamed to say every child in that school gets a mentor. And that mentor is in touch with them on a regular basis to do exactly that and to be a presence. So next Friday, they're going to be in the chemistry classes doing different experiments and talking about different careers that you can do in different areas that you can go into. I think things like Engineering Week, where we go out to the schools and we're actually talking to people and showing them different things are all critically important. Yeah, and I think we can all agree that like mentorship is huge in retention. I probably wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have a mentor who had facilitated my internship at the museum and, and told me, like, even if you didn't study science, you can still do this. And it meant the world to me. So I. I I'm curious to hear from you all too, and I know we have to wrap up in a minute. Is uh, aside from like these job fairs and going out and trying to come, uh, become more involved in these sort of opportunities in the public, how can interested women find good mentors if their school counselor gives them two boxes? Go ahead. It really comes down to the network. Um, and it's not just the network from the counselors in the school. Sometimes that's not a wide enough circle that comes out. And so it can be the parents. It can be through the church. It can be through family, friends, and other relatives. So consider it all the way across um, to be able to get more exposure coming through. A personal anecdote again, my, my daughter was um, STEM and uh, pre-med initially and then went into pharmacy school. But she was getting all this negative reinforcement from family members that were in the profession. Hmm. And uh, yet she had a, a lot of enthusiasm for it and really thought it was a good fit for her. And so, to be honest, we blew off that, those family members. You know, they're, <laughs> we couldn't get rid of them, but there's... <laughs> and, uh, and then went and went farther with people that I knew through work and that had some affiliation in that profession. And all of a sudden, she got encouragement instead and saw some of the good side. So the comment is, mentors are, are wide flung and make sure that you cast the net widely. 
Well, and I think the first step is, is recognizing that you could benefit from a mentor. Um, I think for me, that was a lesson that I took too long to learn, you know, and um, I think for a variety of reasons, uh, girls and women don't seek out mentors, uh, you know, as frequently or in the same way as, you know, men do, and we don't build those networks. So, so yes, I, I'm, I'm agreeing uh, that understand that, you know, you could really benefit from a mentor, um, somebody who's further along in their career. It doesn't even necessarily have to be the exact same, you know, career, same job title that, you know, that you want, but, you know, somebody in the same field and somebody, you know, who can help you with those networks and then cast the wide net, you know, to, to do that and recognize that that relationship goes both ways. I, I have mentored, um, you know, several women, um, you know, who were, who went to the same graduate school that I did, you know, and, um, um, and quite honestly, a lot of times they're the ones that kind of fall off. And, you know, because I think that they haven't learned that lesson that I've learned, and hopefully they'll come back once they do. I'll still be here. Um, you know, but it, it's that, you know, it, it's, it's over time. And a mentor may not, you know, immediately, you know, help you. Um, but having that relationship, you, you never know when, you know, when the value of that advice or the value of that connection, you know, will uh, manifest itself. And so, you know, just kind of make sure that you're keeping an eye out for those potential mentors and, and keeping them, you know, in your, in your world. And, and don't be afraid to reach out to people you don't know at all, right? Yeah. So look, Google something, go to LinkedIn and look for somebody in an area. Most of us are very, very open to responding to almost anyone that, that approaches us and asks a question about engineering or about careers or about any of those things. There's also several programs out there. So MentorNet is one of them for um, post-college. There's also one for collegiates. Um, there's a lot of different types of mentor programs that are out there. Sometimes you just have to look and, and reach out and, and try and find one. Does anybody else have any closing comments or, or anything that you're dying to share? And then there's an awkward silence. Everybody looks at one another. Yeah, so I would, if I were you, if you want the bullet points, takeaway tonight, mentorship is incredibly valuable. We need to change policy in the United States to accommodate maternal and paternal leave, educate the rest of the world and be facilitators and conduits for educational knowledge, and take up a fun hobby like weightlifting. <laughs> So thank you all so much. Let's give a round of a halls. Thank you to C2S2 for hosting.